Friday. That feeds right into what I'm going to talk about today. Yes. We're not surprised. The Lord will answer our prayers. If I can find my page. Yeah. You know that uh, there are two judgments. You know, there's a judgment seat of the believer. That's called the Bema seat. And then there's the other one, that are unsaved people, and that's a great white throne judgment. Okay, the Bema seat is when we're raptured and we stand before the presence of the Lord. The great white throne judgment is at the end of time when all of the unbelievers stand before him. And that's after the millennium. And so, and where he's talking about we should be ready... <laughs> Ann and I had a discussion the other day about doubting Thomas, you know, and uh, she said just because a person doubts doesn't mean they don't believe, and I was saying I doubt it, <laughs> and, we, and so we went back and forth, and every time she would say something, make a statement, I would say I doubt it, and what, what I was really saying is I don't believe it. You know, so when they're talking about doubting Thomas, you know, it said he had to stick his hand in there. And so, you know, not all of the believers who Christ chose really believed that he was who he said he was until he rose again and came back and they saw him in person, you know, <laughs> because Peter and him said, I'm going fishing, you know, like, okay. I'm going fishing. And so the thing is, when Jesus arose from the dead, he told, go tell my disciples and Peter. He wanted to make sure that Peter got included and that Peter knew that he was an ostracized or excommunicated because he had doubts. You know, because we're all going to have some doubts when we step out on faith. You know, that's what he wants us to do. Don't doubt but believe. And that's a hard thing for us to do unless we grow in grace. You know, I'm not going to trust the Lord with a $50,000 debt and put myself into it if I didn't see him provide for the $5 that I needed. And then later on, I needed $10 and he provided. And then on and on and on. And sometimes when you doubt, you know... You think it might be what you want, Lord, but it might not be. And that's why Gideon said, Lord, <laughs> he said, I'm not the man for this job to go take, <clears throat> capture these people and defeat them. And he said, the Lord told him, yes, you are. And so he said, uh, I'll put out this fleece. And he put out this fleece. He said, now if there's water all around, but it's dry. He says, I'll know it's you. And so the Lord did that. The ground was wet and the fleece was dry. And so he says, well, Lord, you know, I'm really not sure. How about this time you make the fleece wet and the ground dry? And the Lord said, okay. And he did it. So he says, okay, I'll do it. And he calls all of Israel to come. And he had this 30,000 people come. And the Lord says, it's too many. And he said, What? He said, those that are scared, let them go home. Most of them went home. And you know this, uh, hopefully you know the story, how it dwindled down to 300. And 300 was going to go against this big army out there. But they won. They surrounded the camp. They had a torch and a globe over it so nobody could see it. And then they broke the globe and fire, and the enemy was sleeping in the middle of the night and the Fire was all around, they got and they killed themselves fighting, you know, because they weren't ready. But it's important for us to be ready. Now, here I'm in the book of Amos, and Amos is from the south, he's a country boy, because it was desert out where he was, and he's going to go all the way up north to Samaria. Samaria was built, the town of that was built on a high hill, okay, and so they were pretty proud that nobody's ever going to be able to take us, just like Jerusalem was built on a hill, and they think nobody's ever going to take Jerusalem because it's fortified, and the walls are high, 
but it happened. And you know, in chapter 4, that Amos talks to the women, the women that were in luxury, and he called them cows of Bashan. Remember that? And because Bashan was a very lush land. Now, you probably don't remember a lot of the stories, but way back with Abraham and Lot, you know, they were having some friction with the people who were tending their flocks. And Abraham said, you know, he said, it's not good for us to have our men fighting with each other. So you take one side and I'll take the other side. You pick what you want. And Lot looked out there and see this luscious grass out there. And he said, I'll take the plains out here. And Abraham said, okay, and I'll go here. But you know, when he chose the pleasant pick, he was looking for, man, I'm really going to make it here. I got this good. But he ended up down in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, but he became a leader down there because when we talk about the gates of the city, that's where all of the activity is. That's where the judges would sit. That's where the leaders would sit. That's where the tax collectors would sit. It's because most of the cities had walls around them and they had to come through the gates. And if the caravans came through selling stuff, you know, that's what Matthew was. He was a tax collector. People come through, they want to sell their goods. They got to pay him, you know, taxes on it. And if people come by and they want to buy something, they have to pay a property tax and all that. So, you know, people hated the tax collectors because they were Jews working for the Roman government and they could rip their own people off and get away with it. But anyway, here, you know, the kingdom split now. You got the southern kingdom which is Judah, the northern kingdom, which is Israel. And Israel, the northern kingdom, had just had a great victory of a small couple of small cities, and they were living up there, and they were partying, and they were having a good time. And then here Amos comes along, and he's upsetting their little apple cart, you know. And he says to these women, you're like the cows of Bashan. You're well fed. You're fat. You know, and it's funny. After I said that last week, Charlene looked it up on her uh, expanded version of the Bible. And it said, call them fat, fat cows. You know, so they were well fed fat. And so here, the women were encouraging their husbands to go out get more money so they can live a more luxurious life than they had, you know. And so they're taking advantage of the poor and they're doing it thinking that they're getting rich, we're having it great, nobody's bothering us. And then he says down here in verse 6 of chapter 4 I'm reading, he said, I have punished you in the past for a lot of your iniquities. And these are some of the things that he did. He said, And also I have given you cleanness of teeth in your cities. Now that didn't mean giving them a tube of toothpaste. You know, it means that you're going hungry. You're not going to be eating anything. And you're not going to have any stuff stuck in your teeth. you got to pick it out. He said, you're going to have cleanness of teeth. You're going to be hungry for it. And then he says, I gave you cleanness of teeth. And I gave you a want for bread in your places, and you have not returned to me, says the Lord. And also, I have withholden the rain from you. He said, I let it rain on one city, but other cities I didn't. He says, and two or three cities had to go to one city to get water to drink, and he still weren't satisfied. He said, and still you didn't cry to me for help. And then down in uh, verse 9, he says, I have smitten you, or I have caused blasting and mildew, and your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees, when they increased, the palmer worm came and ate them. Now, if you go back to Joel, Joel, back in a couple <clears throat> prophecies back, he talked about, you old men, you old women, has anything like this happened in your day? And he says, what the palmer worm 
ate, what they left, the canker worm ate, and what they left, the caterpillar left, and it went all the way down to the roots. He said, so it stripped them bare. And he says, there has never been a plague like this in all of Israel. And then he goes on to say, but yet there is another plague that's going to be coming in the future at the end of the years, and it's going to be worse than this one. And so here we see this. He, he says, all of the, in verse 10, I have sent among you pestilence after the manner of Egypt, and your young men have I slain by the sword and have taken away your horses. He means the horses died, so they couldn't do the plowing. They couldn't do the different activities. And he said, I made the stink of your camps to come up in your nostrils. He said, it was so bad that everything was dying around you, and yet you did not return to me. He's trying to get it across to them. You know, and just before that, he says, when I brought you up out of the land of Egypt... You were the only group of people that I really knew. I performed all these miracles for you so you could witness to others about me and then you turn out to be just like them. And then he says in uh, verse 11, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. He says, and you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. He says, you were almost like you were going to burn up. He says, but yet I rescued you and brought you out. And you get back in the fire and I rescue you and I bring you out. He says, but you haven't learned your lessons. And then he says, in verse uh, 12, Therefore, thus will I do unto you, O as Israel, and because I will do this unto you, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. He's saying, I'm warning you, prepare to meet me. And he means there's going to be a slaughter. But yet he gives them warning, come back to me. Then he says here in chapter 5, Hear ye this word which I take up against you. Even a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel is fallen. She will no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land, and there is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, The city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. And that which went forth of a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. And how can you be more plain? He says, look, you were supposed to be my witnesses, but instead of being witnesses, you got stuck on yourself and you thought just because you had a couple of good victories, you're abusing the poor people in the neighborhood and the righteous man can, can't get any justice done because you're up here on the party land. And he said that I'm going to meet you and then you're going to be sorry. Just in one of the other chapters, he said, I am going to go to Bethel and I am also going to go to Gilgal. Now, Bethel was supposed to be the house of the Lord, but that's where they put the golden calf, and they went up there and they were worshiping the golden calf. And uh, Gilgal <coughs> is where they went across Jordan. That's where Joshua set up camp right before they went to the promised land. And that's where they had an act of faith because all of the males that were going to fight were circumcised. And there was a place that was so big, you know, these soldiers that they called it the Hill of the Foreskin. And so he said that became a very sacred place because all of the men were laid up for a couple of days and couldn't move very well. And so he said that they had to go by faith that the enemy's not going to come when I'm hurting and attack me. And he said, don't go to Gilgal. That, that was a holy place, but you made it a place of sin. 
Don't go over to the house of God because you put that golden calf over there. I'm going to go over. I'm going to destroy that cow. I'm going to break off his horns, which is the sign of his power. And then you won't have it. That'll be your God. And you're going to see what I'm going to do to him. And then he says here, for thus says the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek me and you shall live. But seek not Bethel nor Gilgal and pass not to Beersheba. Beersheba was down south in Judah. He says, they're going to get it next. So if you think you're going to run away and go down there, better not go there because they're going to get it next. And he said, Seek the Lord, but seek not Bethel nor enter into Gilgal. And pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Seek the Lord, and you shall live. Again he says it. Lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph. Now the reason he says in the house of Joseph, you have to get this terminology that they're saying. Because they usually refer to Jacob as the father of both the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And then, after they split, they called the southern kingdom Israel. Sometimes they called it Jacob because when Jacob went to Bethel, he said, that's a house of God. That's where Jacob's name was changed because Jacob means a heel catcher or a manipulator or a person who likes to trip people up. So he changed his name from heel catcher to one that Israel, meaning governed by God. So God changed his name there. And so whenever they refer to the northern kingdom as the house of Jacob, they said, you're like he used to be before he was converted. Now they're saying he's like the house of Joseph. Now Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. And he went down into Egypt, you know. They were sold into slavery down there. But the Lord was blessing him all along the way. And while he was in Egypt, he had two sons by an Egyptian woman. Okay? And that was Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, when they were coming up into the land, remember the half-tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay on this side, and half of them went on that side. But... Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph, and they took up that major part of the land in Israel, which was on both sides of the Jordan River. And so they were the biggest tribes, and that's where Samaria was. And so they're saying about the house of Joseph. And he says, And like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there shall be none to quench it in Bethel. And you have turned judgment to wormwood, and you have you have off righteousness in the earth. You leave off righteousness in the earth. And wormwood is like bitterness, you know. And there is like Chernobyl. That is sort of like wormwood. You remember. When the over in Russia, when that uh, nuclear reactor went up and it turned everything to just mess, you know, and so that's what he's saying here it's a mess. Then in verse 8, he says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars of Orion and turneth the shadow of death into morning, maketh the dark night and called for the waters of the sea. And pour them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Okay. Now, he's saying here, as you look at it, he is in control of the weather. He's in control of the oceans. He's controlled all of the skies. He controls the light and the day. And he can do what he wants. That's what he's saying here. You put your faith in something that can't deliver you. Something that can't even deliver itself. Can't move, can't talk, can't see, can't smell. And so, then he says, That strengtheneth the spoiled against the strong, so that the spoiled shall come against the fortress. 
He said, and you have spoiled and ruined all of these weak people who you counted as nothing. And now eventually they're going to rise up and fight against you. And he says, he's going to strengthen the hands of the weak. Now, eventually the northern kingdom went into captivity. Over here in verse 10 he says, They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. And he's saying here, he said, You people, you don't realize how despised you are by your own people, the poor people. He says, and eventually, the people that want to do right don't say anything because they know that you're going to clamp down on them. That's what he says. For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and you take from him the burdens of wheat, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, and you shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. It says the people that want to help, the people who want to do right, they're going to be quiet because they know that you got the power and they don't. So they're going to keep quiet. Then he goes down here and he says, verse 14. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have spoken. Hate the evil, love the good. Establish judgment in your gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Meaning, not everybody will go into captivity. Where before he said if a hundred go out, only ten are going to be left. And it's going to get worse because there are going to be dead bodies all over. Then he says here in verse uh, 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. Or went into the house and leaned on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it. Now... Israel for a long time has been blinded to what God wants them to do. Now, they are looking for their Messiah. They can't comprehend the fact that God became man and then lived among us. He was crucified, but he had the power to raise himself up again. So they have a hard time believing that. They believe they're going to have a man that comes in like David. He's going to be strong. He's going to be charismatic. He's going to have everybody follow him. And then he's going to lead them to victory. That's what they're looking for is the Messiah to come. And so that's why when the Antichrist comes, he's going to be so charismatic. He'll be able to do miracles, call thunder, fire down from heaven. And he says they are going to believe a lie. He says, because their eyes have been blinded. And he says, once the rapture takes place, God says he's going to send a strong delusion among these people who did not accept Jesus as their Savior that they would be willing to believe a lie. Now, over in Israel, they want peace at any cost. Except the Palestinians don't. The Palestinians want Israel removed from the land completely at any cost. And you see what's going on today, and it could escalate and escalate and escalate. Now, for years, the United States has been right there with Israel. And uh, the current president says that he is for Israel. They have a right to defend themselves. 
but he's still going through Iran and giving them all these billions of dollars and they are going over supplying over here with Hezbollah and Hamas with rockets that they can shoot over Israel and they're shooting them over. They have over 100,000 rockets aimed at Israel and just the other day they shot a thousand of them off and he said, if Israel doesn't get out of Jerusalem by Wednesday, that was this past Wednesday, that they will have 10 times that many rockets come. And that's when Israel said that there was a rumor that was going around that there were Israeli ground troops going to be moving over into Israel. And all of the Hezbollah, not all of them, but many of the leaders ran into the tunnel. See, they have tunnels that are a mile long, maybe a half mile on this side of the border and a half mile on that side so they can go through the tunnels come up there at night destroy a bunch of people civilians even and then run back down so these people came into the tunnels and then instead of having ground troops on they sent the air force in and they started bombing these tunnels where all of these terrorists were and then they said oh they blew up this building and these kids are over there by the building but see they don't tell you that Israel always gives the people in Gaza and places around at least an hour notice that we're going to do such and such at such and such a time. And so we want you to clear out because they're not trying to really kill the people. They want to kill the infrastructure that they have set up. But it's getting to the place where it's going to be bad. So then he says down here, that Israel, woe unto you, you desire the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord begins at the time of the rapture. Because there's going to be that seven year tribulation period. And it's going to go on. And then there's going to be that war. And it's going to go on. And then it's going to come back. The Lord's going to come back with the church, with the believers and have a thousand year reign here. So we see that the thousand year reign is going to be peace and calm. That's where the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb. That's where the child is going to play by the serpent's hole. And he says, and he won't bite him. So, but Israel is looking for a Messiah who's going to bring back the temple. And now, we have to realize that God is saying, you as believers are the temple. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. And they're still thinking, we have to have this temple because we have to do the sacrifices. And the Lord is going to say, when he comes back, he said, if you make a sacrifice, it's like offering a dead dog to God because the perfect one and only sacrifice of Lord Jesus Christ has already been sacrificed to take away all of your sins. And now you're trying to give me an offering like this when he's already done it. You can't add anything to what he has done. So that's why it is grace. That's why we say it is amazing grace. Amen. How sweet the sound. I deserve hell. And if you and I had to stand before God, when you live your life down here, <laughs> it's on a big screen up in heaven. Even your thoughts. God knows your thoughts before you think them. And that's the hard thing for us to realize, that he loved us while we were yet sinners. We're still sinners, but we're saved by grace. And as Jim was saying here a little bit ago about in John, he says that, we have to love one another. We have to live righteously. We have to depend upon Him. We have to walk in the light. And then over here on... Uh, in verse 21 of chapter 5, He said, I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings... I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vows. But let 
judgment run down as water and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have you offered me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? Now here, here gets the hard part that he's going to tell them. He says, but you have borne the tabernacle of Molech and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which you have made for yourself. Therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And now what he's telling these people, you were supposed to be different. But all of a sudden, you're becoming more and more like the people that you drove out. Now this god Moloch was their god of fire. It was a god of an animal like and his arms would be out like this and they would build a fire here and they would sacrifice their children on here as a peace offering to God, to the cows. You know, you said, that's ridiculous. But you know, he's always said, God's always said, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, we here in the United States consider ourselves civilized because we have been basing our country's morality on the Judeo-Christian values. But in other countries where there is not that same law, there is wickedness that you can't comprehend and I can't comprehend unless you see it. Now, here I'm going to say this here in... Uh, Jeremiah chapter 32 and starting with verse 35. He says this, And they had built high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind, that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And now therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, whereof you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. He said, Behold, I will gather them out of the, all the countries where I have delivered them in mine anger and in my fury and in my wrath, I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. Now they're back into the land. You know, they were out of the land for a long, long time. But now they're back in the land, and God is providing for them. Now, I have another verse here I want to read. And, let me see. This is back in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter... 18. And it's in the Old Testament. And this is the law. And he was saying, this is why he's putting these people out of there. And it's 18 and verse 21. He says, 1821. 18, 18, verse 21. If I could find Leviticus 18. Okay, here it is. And he said, these are in the law. He said, Moreover, thou shalt not lay carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lay with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Defile not yourselves in any of these things. For in all of these nations they are defiled which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. 
Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and ye shall commit any of these abominations. He says, I will cast you out. And so here, that's what he's reminding these people. I've told you over and over and over again. And the only reason that we are a civilized country here in the United States <coughs> is because of the Holy Spirit who moves in the lives of Christians that holds back the forces of evil. And the scripture says that he that letteth will let until he's taken out of the way. It means that he, the Holy Spirit, is permitting just a little bit of this evilness to come, but he's holding back the full force until the rapture takes place. When the rapture takes place, and then the fullness of the evil is going to come out. And that's what he's saying, that we should live lives that are righteous. And then here in chapter 6, and I'll just do a couple of verses here. Woe unto them that are ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. He's saying Zion, and, and that more or less refers to Jerusalem, and then Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. And he said Zion and trust, and beside that word trust in mind, they have something that says, a trust in the Lord. Now, in the book of Psalms, it, you see that many times one book will refer back to something else that was said, and another book would refer to something else that was said. So the whole Bible together as a whole, you know, explains its capacity here. Now, back in Psalm 2, that is more or less a psalm of when Christ was going to be crucified. And it says in Psalm 2 and chapter 12, then it has a note by that, that the trust is supposed to be in God. And God said that he and the Son are one. So when Jesus came, he said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent, meaning Jesus. And then... If you go back to the second psalm and verse 12, it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from off the earth. And there it is, S-O-N. It's talking about the son of God. And then when you get over to Psalm 22, it's a picture of Christ hanging on the cross. And he's saying that the bowls of Bashan, and remember we said Bashan was the light and they called the women that were like the cows of Bashan, well-fed, fat people. And then he's hanging on the cross in Psalms 22 and it says that the bulls of Bashan have compassed me about. Meaning those evil strong men who haven't crucified him yet and who haven't been here you know, because they haven't got to this period of time yet. So God knows the future before it happens. And so he's saying already that he's going to be hanging on a cross. He's going to be crucified. And these evil people who think they are religious, you know, because that's what Jesus said to them, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says, you're hypocrites. You're whited walls. You're like dead man bones inside of you because you are persecuting the poor. And he said, that's what he came here for. And I'm going to stop with this. He says, you think you are so strong and mighty in these capitals because you're fortified. He says, go into Columbus and see from thence and go to Hamath, a great city, and then go down to Gath of the Philistines are they stronger than your kingdoms and their borders greater than your borders? You that put forth away evil day and cause the seat of violence to come near. 
He said, you keep saying, oh, God's not going to do anything. Nah, he's not going to do anything. Oh, the Lord's not coming back. You think he's coming back to rapture you? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. You know? So, he says, eat, drink, and be merry. And he says, in a day you think he's not coming, he's coming. And he doesn't say that to scare you, but he's given us opportunities to witness. How is our life here? What are we building? Are we sending any forth into heaven? You know, every day, like yesterday, I had a stack of mail like this. You know, and I'm sure you all get that same thing. Every one of them had a picture of a child with a cleft lips. And then they had these poor Indian children out there that are starving. Then you have these paralyzed soldiers. You know, all of these different things that break your heart. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and you say, oh God, I want to help. How can I help? I don't have the funds to help, but I got to help. You had that longing. You had the desire to do. You know, and we need to realize that things are speeding up faster than we realize. That Jesus is coming back again. And if you really believe it, you'll start living for him. You know, rather than for pleasure. And we say, a lot of times, he's talking about, and we'll get into that next week, where he's telling the prophet, go home, be quiet, don't go preaching that stuff here anymore. Go back to your neighborhood and let them pay you money and feed you. And he said, I don't want to hear that. And that's how we are getting to be in our churches that people don't want to hear sin. People don't want to hear about the blood of Jesus. You know, and they don't want to hear that I have to repent. You know, what does that mean? So he's saying that, <laughs> I'll say that for next week. Because he's going to have one of the priests of the cow, you know, the golden calf, come to him and say, don't you know this is the king's chapel? You shouldn't be here talking like that. Go home. And then he gives him an earful. So if you want to know what happens, read Amos chapter 6 and 7, and we're going to finish up next week. Okay, let's stand and we'll pray. And